Hi, I'm Mercy. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Mercy. Mercy. <laughs> I was told I was going to introduce Krista today, so now I'm the suspect. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was totally not prepared to um, introduce her, and I was not prepared to speak today. But um, so uh, where it started for me is um, I started drinking. I was about 12 years old, and um, I am a child of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, my mother got sober when I was six years old, so I grew up at Fremont. And um, I, I knew the chances of, you know, um, having this disease for quite a while before I decided I was going to drink. And um, what happened to me that day was, um, at that point, what I thought was a spiritual experience. Like, the skies opened up and was like, whoa. I had found the answer to life. Like I didn't have to think about anything. I didn't have to care. Um, everything was great. I felt okay inside my skin, which I had not known in my growing up. And um, as my stories go, I uh, quickly chased that into the gates of insanity. Um, I was a blackout drinker by the time I was 14 to 16. I don't remember much. Um, I spent a lot of time in and out of institutions, juvenile, and um, it, it was it was a tough time for me. I'm surprised um, that I made it. Uh, I hit my first treatment center uh, when I was 16, and um, I by then had found other things that made me feel better because. <coughs> Um, drinking wasn't making me feel okay anymore. And um, thinking about that day when I showed up at treatment, you know, um, like Krista said, I, I do know how to ask for help. And uh, I had reached out to my mother and said, like, I'm done. Um, she said, you know, I got you a spot to go to this treatment center. And I said, okay. And so my best plan was like, if I was going to make it there, like I couldn't sleep, right? Like I had to, I had to stay awake. <laughs> make it to this 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 appointment and um i did make it there to rider treatment center in lake city and um i proceeded to do my intake and fall asleep during the intake and fall asleep on the lawn uh, filling out the paperwork and um at this time i was not living at home i was living on the streets and um my mom didn't want to take me home they weren't gonna let me in that day that was her plan they were gonna let me in that day they were not and um, she didn't want to take me home. <laughs> and they uh, convinced her to take me home. And um, I and landed on the couch and passed out. And I remember her waking me up and I was so mad. I was like, you don't understand. <laughs> like, I have to stay awake for this thing. And like, I haven't slept in days. And, and how dare you like wake me up? Not, I haven't been sleeping that long. And, she said, Mercy, you've been sleeping for 22 hours. You should probably get up. <laughs> and so um, I got to stay at home until I um, went into Ryther, which, you know, bless her soul. It was not a safe place for her to have me in the house. Um, I had stole from her. I had left home many a times. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time at home at that time. And... Um, I got into Ryder Treatment Center and um, I did not complete that program. I um, got into a confrontation um, with a young boy and um, I don't know, I, I, I believe I pled my case. I'm really good at that. of like how it was not my fault. <laughs> and um, I did not get myself kicked out of treatment. I got a timeout. They sent me home for two weeks and then made me come back. <laughs> and so I was like, I don't know what's going on here. Like, I can't even do that right. Um, but they had sent me home and came back. And then I was really upset that I wasn't going to graduate with my people. You know, um, I'd made some connections there with kids my age that had my kind of story. And, um, you know, just like every time I ended up in juvenile, when I ended up there, like, this was it. I was gonna, you know, everything in my heart believed that, like, this was, this, I was gonna make it. And um, 
I had been in this these rooms for 10 plus years hearing the serenity prayer. And thinking back, that was like the first time I understood it. I was reading it in treatment and I went, oh, that's what that means. You know, mm -hmm. I had said it probably thousands and thousands of times, but it was the first time it like hit me. Oh, the things I can change, the things I can't. <clears throat> and again, like I said, I thought I had this. Um, I didn't make it very long out of that treatment center. And uh, within that next year, um, I went to a correctional facility for a year. Um, I didn't get as much time again. I'm really good at like convincing them. It's like not my fault and all these things in life happened to me. And, um, I got that taken down from doing three and a half years to only doing a year, hmm. but it was also in the condition of this. There's this thing that happens to me is when I, uh, get locked up and I have this structure and this like idea of what I'm supposed to do, then I act really good. And, um, the stipulations they put on me was that um, I would spend a year in jail. And if I got in trouble while I was in there, I would spend a year and a half and I would do six months in prison. And so I was really good. <laughs> I was really good. I did all the stuff they asked. I did all the things. Um, I had some counselors in there that was really tough going. Um, I actually, on the way out of that facility, got that counselor fired for the mistreatment that she uh, did towards me. Um, it was tough, but again, I was convinced this is it. I'm done. Um, scared to death to go to prison. Um, I had lasted a year of probation, um, back in these rooms again. And, um, there I went again. Um, I took another member of Alcoholics Anonymous with me on the way out the door. Um, we are at the QFC buying our booze to go get drunk, and the uh, person checking us out is a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I can't go anywhere without finding you guys. <laughs> I've been here since I was six. Um, <laughs> that didn't stop us. That didn't stop us. Um, and so within that um, next little amount of time, um, I had caught another charge, and I ran away as I always did, ran away from all of it and uh, went to Milwaukee, Wisconsin with a boyfriend. Um, didn't come back until again, I had thorough, like, convinced it's, you know, I wasn't that bad of a thing. Like, I'm going to come back. I'm not going to get too much time, right? Like, everything's going to be okay. Um, into NERF, Northern Rehabilitation Center, never going to do it again. I swear, like, I'm good. Um, that didn't last either. Um, I did do one thing. I, I thoroughly committed to not going back to jail. Uh, I was scared to death of prison. Um, and since that stay, I, I've, I have not gone back to jail. Almost uh, 30 years for me now. 28. Um, that didn't stop me, though. Um, I just found ways to not get caught. <coughs> not get in trouble. Um, mm -hmm. I had a child that came into my life and <coughs> one of the things that it, about me is that I tend to care about other people more than I care about myself. And um, that child changed my life and taught me how to be a person I didn't think I was capable of. Um, taught me a love that I didn't understand and I didn't know how to be a part of. <clears throat> but I did my best. And um, that settled me down some. I didn't ever um, completely stop. Um, my life got better, um, but I still had this huge ginormous hole inside of me, even though I had this thing that I loved more than life. And, you know, I had a real job and, and I was making headway in life and changing some behaviors. Like I still just felt this like gaping hole inside, like that nothing could fill. And um, I raised um, my son from kindergarten to um, high school. And I thought I had, you know, solved all the problems. Like I didn't really drink much anymore because I knew what happened to me when I drank. So I knew if I just didn't start, you don't get drunk, right? I learned that here. <laughs> so I just didn't start. Um, uh, but I had many other issues and um, what finally brought me here is um, the 
the dissolving of that relationship, um, walking away because I couldn't, I couldn't stay in the relationship anymore. <clears throat> my son's actually still in my life. Um, he came to visit me today at work out of the blue. So still a great blessing in my life. Um, but I just, this gaping hole opened wide back open and there I was again, off and running. I had, I had nothing else outside of me to have a better life for. I was just left with me. And um, that was never a good place. So um, my mom passed away and um, in, in dealing with that, I saw myself going down a really bad road again. And uh, I did what I call one of my 911 prayers, right? Like I only pray when like, God, please, if you get me out of jail, I swear I'll do this. Or if I do this, you'll give me that, right? Like that's the only kind of prayers I knew. And um, I did one of those. I said, okay, I promise. Like the one thing I've never tried is to absolutely quit everything. Like I'll give it a shot. <laughs> But here's my deal, like, I'm going to do this for one year, that's it. And if something doesn't drastically change, like, I'm just doomed to live this life. That's just my calling, whatever, you know, I'm just, I'm doomed. And um, I did, I came into the program and I gave it my best, um, honest shot, as honest as I could be at the time. My honesty today is a lot different than it was back then. And... Um, it didn't even take me a year before that hole, you know, started getting filled up and um, I chose to stay here and I chose here to stay here despite myself. <laughs> um, there's many a times that I felt like I didn't deserve to be alive. Um, I felt like that I could never change, that nothing was ever going to be different and um, that I really wasn't worth um, giving it a shot. Um, but this beautiful thing happened to me is these these people grew up around me that, that told me different. And I believed them. And I listened to them and I worked with them and they helped me see a part of me that I, I had hid a long time ago and helped bring that out in me. And through that, you know, I've been able to go back to school and get an education. Um, I've been able to uh, be proud that um, I am considered still I'm a stepmom, but I'm a mother of my child and he loves me and he respects me. You know, I forgot about that too. And he was the one, he was one of the ones too that hit me when my mom passed. He said, you know, you left my mom to have a better life and what are you doing? And that hit me. You know, that was another reason that I, I made that call out. And um, I continue to, you know, fight my demons, uh, walk through my battles. I've had them in sobriety. Um, about seven years into my sobriety, I had another relationship that broke up. Thought it was the one, you know, and... Um, I, I left because it wasn't, and that's not like me. I left for me, and I don't do that. And um, it left me still very broken and not understanding why I make good decisions, and I'm still broken. And um, <coughs> it, it, it almost broke me. And uh, again, I continue to reach out, and I continue to tell people what was going on with me. At seven years sober, I'm struggling. I'm, I'm not okay. And I love to hear people in these rooms with lots of time to like say that, admit that, like it happens. Um, I've never really been out on my own. Um, I was taking care of my niece because uh, my, my brother is also a member of this program and is not in it. And I tried to take on that responsibility and um, it was a struggle. Her and I ended up back with him and uh, he was one of my biggest abusers. And he was also one of my biggest, you know, amends that I got to make <coughs> because some of those amends I can't make, they're not here anymore in my family. And uh, it about drove me back out. I couldn't take it. Um, I had to walk away from my niece. I had to walk away from him. 
and and pull up the bootstraps and see how much I could care about me. Um, I it was I had two options at one point. It was the only thing that came to my mind because I worked through these steps and the gift was given to me that I don't have the desire to use and drink. I haven't had a long time, not since the first time I did the steps, the first year I was sober. But I'm standing there with, I'm going to a mental work because I am losing my shit or I'm going to kill myself. Well, if I tell people I'm going to kill myself, I'm going to end up in the mental ward anyway. So I might as well just go, right? <laughs> so I'm ready to go to the mental ward. And uh, the only thing I can say is, is learning how to pray from that first 911 prayer. Like I got a call on the phone and I got into an Oxford house. You know, um, not a lot of people talk about that. You know, I had two Oxford houses that turned me down because I had too much sobriety for them. Mm. Um, even though, you know, I don't know if I didn't plead my case enough, um, but I had one that let me in. And um, I've been there for the last two and a half years and it saved my life. Um, I, I do a lot of my service work there. Um, with uh, the girls in my house, they rotate through, you know, sometimes it's hard, um, but the ones that stay, you know, we've built a great family. Um, I moved into a new area when this happened up north. I spent all my life in Seattle and it's called shell shock. And, and I was lucky to find people in the program um, that have become family to me. Uh, I have some women in my life today that I, I trust with my life. You know, and that's the kind of stuff I thought street code on the streets, you know, like that's, that's what they say. But honestly, there's women in my life. I, I trust with my life today. Like, um, it took me a little while to get out of that, it's, um, uh, relapse of mindset. I call it, you know, it took me a couple of years for them women to like guide me. Like I made no decisions in my life without consulting them. Not you know, they care for me a lot more than I'm able to care for myself sometimes. And so, um, <coughs> great thing that's happened in the last year or so for me is that like those people are really proud of me because I don't have to call them as much. Like I'm making my own decisions today. I'm more stronger in myself and, uh, I have a life that, that I didn't think possible. You know, I, I didn't think that I deserved the people in my life that I have today. And, and I don't know how to contain the amount of love for the people that I have in my life. It overwhelms me <laughs> quite often. The, the amount of love that comes out of me for the people I have in my life. Krista, um, it's a great treasure to have in my life. Um, and I don't know what, where I would be without, you know, making that decision that I was going to just give it one more shot. So, you know, if you're sitting here and you're, you know, hurting and you got a lot of time and you think that you should have everything solved, like, please speak up. Please let us other people hear that because I might not have said something if I didn't hear other old timers in these rooms saying, I'm 20 years sober and I'm struggling, you know, because I got this idea that it's got to look like this and it's got to be all good and I should be further along than I am in life. And, um, if I didn't hear those messages, I don't know that I'd be here. So thank you guys for all coming out. Oh, my time was up. I thought there was going to be a beep. I apologize. No, no <laughs> I'm looking at like 15 seconds. <laughs> thank you guys. Thanks for being here.